That's it. So no choice. You study the course I tell you to study. Forget about doing psychology, you psycho or what? Forget about this. Yeah? The only four occupations that are important in life, medicine, engineering, accounting, and law. Everything else for people who have no ambition. Have you heard this before? In some cultures, only four, four, four. So that's why when, when people come to us in career, career sense, uh, career guidance, uh, parents will tell children, I want you to do this. And the child says, mommy, but I, I'm not very good in science. Never mind, you just become good. <laughs> yeah? I always wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted a doctor, a, law, a lawyer, or a doctor in the family. Yeah? You know how many crooks there are around the place? Ah, you know how to defend those crooks, you'll be very rich. <laughs> okay, so uh, that, kind, that kind of mentality, yeah? you do as I tell you to do, external control. I use whatever means to influence you, to, to change you. And if you don't, there will be consequences. The same thing in parenting. Yeah? The, 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 the same thing in relationships. The same thing teachers do with their children. I am the teacher. I know better than you. Okay? External control. You've heard that before, right? That's a, a, in school all the time. Yeah? Don't ask questions. Too many questions. You don't know what you're talking about. And I humiliate you. You know who I am or not? Chegu. Okay? <coughs> so, it is right for me to punish those who don't follow and to reward you. Why can't you be like your sister? You heard that? Why can't you be like this student in the class? This is so, so, so quiet, so good, so attentive, so obedient, so robotic. You are unrobotic, you are too creative. Be like her. Otherwise, you create problems for me. Don't create, I just have got no more problems. So, the constant comparison. Because we think that's the way to motivate, motivate. You know, I, I always tell a, a story in the old days um, how we used to motivate children. You know, with the, your child, you've got you've got two children. Um, your child comes home and he's got a red mark. Okay, red mark. Mathematics, fifty or oh, forty marks out of one hundred. Then what do we do? You come back with a red mark. School him. Kena rotan. In fact, in the old days when I was in school, the principal will come. This was the LaSalle in Clang, not, not here in Brickfields, yeah? The principal was an Australian uh, 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 brother. And he will come and he will read out all those with red marks. Eight subjects, if you've got seven red marks, seven rotan. <laughs> and and do we, what do we do? We study the next time because backside too painful. <laughs> right? We study. So, you go be your parents, you've got red marks, you get scolding and you get rotan. That's so why you study super hard. This time you pass, but you got 80 marks. You pass, you got 80 marks. And when you got 40 marks, they will come. Why can't you be like your cousin next door? You see, he studies so hard. You see, he come out and so proud. The parents so proud. You embarrass me. You, you know, be like him. Okay? And then he studies super hard. He got 80 marks. Yeah? And, 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 uh, and the cousin there dropped in performance, got 50 marks. Papa, 80 marks. I wonder, uh, you, you compare me, uh, 50 marks. And Papa says, how does Papa feel inside? Proud. But will Papa tell the son? No. Because I want to motivate the son ma, to continue. Because if I tell the son, quiet, quiet, very good, keep up the good work, means he will stop studying hard. Right? Papa will say, don't compare. <laughs> don't compare. Now he studies super hard. He gets 100 marks. The one still fail. <laughs> Papa, finally, your, your trick work. I'm studying super hard. 100 marks. Papa is so happy inside. But Papa say, well done, son. No, Papa will say, hey, you cheated. Ah. <laughs> Easy, ah, the test. That's why you got 100 marks. <laughs> right? We never do what we need to do to motivate people. Huh? So, 21st century parenting requires us to be also psychologists, to understand psychology in a different way so that we can also help our children grow and develop into healthy, uh, functioning human beings. So, what is right for you from the traditional way, which was a lot of external control? Huh? So, look at, look at this. In the old days, this is what we used to do, and, and a lot of it even today. Huh? When, I, when I walk around schools, when I, when I look at how we relate with our own students, yeah? Uh, seven deadly habits and seven caring habits, yeah, from criticizing versus supporting, from blaming versus encouraging, complaining versus listening, nagging versus accepting, threatening versus trusting, trusting that our children 
because they are your children they are part of us they have some wisdom because you brought them into this world yeah you nurtured them in the early years of life there must be something right that you have been doing in those early years of life uh, respecting versus punishing and, and, and you know versus rewarding bribing uh, to control let's see how we can look at the difference that you have and leverage on that difference yeah so what we try to do is, is try to look at things on the left hand side to try to promote that versus uh, what is on the right hand side yeah criticizing blaming so but it's so difficult huh? easier said than done a lot of people tell me I mean I'm a parent myself I've got two kids one 14 years old and one 16 years old. so very exciting times teenagers okay and that's a, a talk for a different day uh, it's so difficult huh? and what are some of the therefore challenges this thing called deep democracy you know children know their rights democracy is about rights right you have a right to speak you have a voice in the old days you had no voice if I had a teacher, I had a parent, Rotan, you just say, thank you, sir. If I ask you to jump, you just say, how high? <laughs> you don't say, why? Why? The sun's so hot. Why do I have to do? No question about why. Because I told you to do, you just follow. Now deep democracy. No, 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 no. I have a right. You cannot touch me. Uh -huh. I pay your salary, don't forget. <laughs> you cannot touch me. If you try to do that, you will go to prison. This is what happened to uh, recently in the papers, isn't it? Like you, you read about this, our tourism director in Europe got sentenced. Different culture, it's a culture shock. Part and parcel of the spanking is the, the Malaysian way of life. You try doing this in, in Australia, you try doing this in, in the UK, in, in Europe, you will go to prison, even if you are the parent. That's how serious it is. So consolidation of this age of deep democracy, constantly questioning, questioning, questioning. In our time, you didn't dare question, especially you wouldn't dare do it to your parents. Okay? This shift from a culture of uh, obedience to a culture of meaning. If you want me to do something, it has to be meaningful. If I want to do something, it's because I like it. Whether you as parents like it, that's your problem. As long as I like it, I will do it. Even if you as parents don't want me to do it. If you want me to do it, tell me why I should do it. It has to be meaningful for me. So in the old days, uh, Papa, Mommy says, Teacher says, just do, we just do. You know, remember the famous saying, yours is not to reason why, yours is just to do or die. So don't question, just go, charge of the light brigade, do, because father knows best. Nowadays, <laughs> uh, uh, why? <laughs> why? Okay, so versus meaning, uh, it has to be meaningful. Then this, this culture, you know, my, my family actually is in Australia at the moment. Uh, they've been there three years. I, I shuttle up and down. I'm an absentee father at the moment, talking about parenting. <laughs> um, and, and very interesting, the neighborhood I, 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 I live in, the Aussies uh, have what we call a throwaway mentality. My, my sister-in-law, who, who's been there for 30 over years, 40 years, <laughs> says this of her own children. Yeah? Um, throwaway, things that are perfectly good. They will even throw away bicycles because why? Uh, flat tire already. La. <laughs> Easier to just go and buy a new bicycle than fix the flat tire. Or, you know, maybe a bit disjointed. I, I, the other day, when I was back uh, last uh, two, three weeks ago, they had thrown away a whole bunch of furniture, shelves and cupboards and tables. The moment you know, I, I passed by with my wife, this was about 10, 11 o'clock in the night, and it is all outside the, the house. She says, stop. <laughs> Go down and take a look. And my God, you know, uh, with, with the help of a, 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 a friend, we were able to put in about four different cupboards, perfectly functioning. Why? They just wanted to change design. There was another cupboard, thick, solid wood, thick wood. You know, really, in, not cheap board, huh? really thick wood. The, 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 because it was white in color, white in color, they didn't like it. Actually, it was brown. And they thought it would look better with white, so they painted white. And then they realized it's worse than the brown. So what did they do? They threw it outside. So what I did was, and it's heavy, huh? nice shelves, it's a showcase with glass. I brought it up to the house, spent three weeks during my Christmas break, redoing it, sandpapering it, spent maybe about 15 Aussie dollars, varnishing it with sandpaper and so forth. After that, I varnished it. Now if you come to the house, this one will cost a few hundred 
Aussie dollars, maybe close to a thousand ringgit, easily. Perfectly functioning. Throw away society. Yeah, instant. I don't like I throw away. I don't like I throw away. That's how it is. Immediate gratification. If I want something, I must have it yesterday. Not now, yesterday. I, I want something yesterday. So fast. Yeah? And why? Because whenever today when you see children growing up, if they want something, they make a bit of fuss, you are in the in the shopping mall. What happens? You are in the shopping mall, your four year old uh, grandson, because most of you are around my age, you would be grandchildren already. Yeah. Uh, granddaddy, granddaddy, balloon, balloon. I won. And uh, of course, you know the value of money. The child will maybe play for what, 10 seconds, <laughs> and then it will explode. And then you might as well just have blown five ringgit away. You might as well say, son, maybe you'll have more fun just burning this five ringgit rather than playing with the balloon. Huh? Because ultimately, that's, that's basically what it is. If you want to burn money here, burn. <laughs> Right? And maybe you would learn about fire rather than I give you this balloon and after a while it will just fly away, disappear. But if you try to say no and try to reason with a four-year-old, too expensive. They don't understand concept. All this is nice, I want, I want it now. What will your four-year-old grandson or granddaughter do? What will they do? They will say, sure, grandpa, you are such a wise man. That's why you are already grand. Will they do that? Of course not. They will roll on the floor and they will start crying, isn't it? Ah! And everybody in the shopping mall will look at you and say, what a horrible monster you are. How can you do this to this four-year-old? And because of the shame and embarrassment, what would you do? You buy. And then you say, when you go home, you die. You <laughs> Wait you. And what have we done? We have given in to this instant gratification. We don't teach them impulse control. And that's one of the significant challenges. That's why they call it fast food also. I want this, I want it now. Fast. I have to wait too long, too long. Right? Our time, it's what we call slow food. A lot of things in the crock pot, a lot of things you just have to simmer and boil. Good food takes time. We learn resilience. We learn discipline. Yeah? Um, sometimes that, that's how it is. Yesterday, I, I, I read a, a notice from my son's um, assistant principal uh, to all parents. Yesterday was the start of the, the semester break in Australia for the Easter. And she sent a note to us as parents. She says, I noticed that many parents had taken their child out on Friday rather than let the child finish school. Because usually, last day of school, people think not much to do, so just stay at home. And then she said, we are not teaching them to stay the course. We are not teaching them resilience, our young men. He's in an all-boys school, a, a Catholic school, private Catholic school in, in Sydney. We shouldn't do that. We are sending them the wrong message. How are they going to toughen themselves up and be men of character later on in the future if we just allow them to do as they want coming to school? I wish I could say that to my own parents who are in my international school. Teach them, because so many you know, people ask for, for, can I get your permission to bring them out for this, that, you want to go holiday, right? Um, and, and, you know, we, we have to learn, because there certainly is a value to delay gratification, yeah? And of course, you can't run away from this. Our children know so much, even in the, when I was lecturing in the university, Whatever you say, immediately, instant, they will Google. Sir, this is not accurate. <laughs> Google. Instant information. So we are, cannot be experts, you know, the, the, what we call stage on the stage model of teaching and learning. Huh? We are not experts anymore. Because they have access to information, and it's so fast, they know more than we do. And they know, <coughs> and you cannot control, you cannot watch over them all the time. Huh? What are you watching now? Well, what sites are you going to? How, how do you do that? If you want to give them a, a computer, then that's part and parcel of education today in the 21st century classroom. That's how it is. They will, they will do that. So we have to teach them values. We have to teach them respect. We have to teach them all of those things so that they know how to manage that information. Um, you know, when I talk to my children about, about sex education and from very, very young, you know, I, I have to tell them those things, things, share them with those things that I'm concerned about so that they don't, you know, uh, hopefully, are wise enough 
and respectful enough of themselves so that they don't do things that will get them into trouble. You know, I often give an illustration about how much children know. This, 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 this eight-year-old boy comes up to you and, and says, Papa, Papa, where did I come from? Oh my God, Father will say, children these days are so young already, they want to know about these things, you know. My time, uh, we had to be going, finish school only, then we, ask, we don't even ask our parents. We go and, go and you know, read up those things by ourselves and hear from our friends. We'll talk about those, you know, uh, what's the difference between men and women, about reproduction and so forth. Now, eight years old already, they want to know, die. But because I attended the parenting talk, never mind, modern day parent, okay? If you want to know, sit down. I will talk to you about this. So, first mommy and I met. And then after about 15, 20 minutes, the boy is really getting bored. And then we got married. And then honeymoon night, this is what happened. And nine months later, you came up. Now, do you know where you came from? Then the eight-year-old boy says, Yeah, I knew that already one year ago. <laughs> Internet, nah. I just want to know where I came from because my next-door neighbor, he says he's from Batu Pahat. <laughs> the other one from Klang. So where did I come from? <laughs> Don't try to even, <laughs> okay? And on top of it, yeah, you know, all the different types of uh, families that we have, okay? And, and we need to understand some of these things, yeah? In the old days, yeah, we talk about maybe 30, 40 years ago, we talk about extended families. You know, when I grew up, uh, in my early years, my uh, grand-auntie, my, my grandmother's sister who was uh, single, she never, I think she got married, but I don't know what happened really to, to her husband and, you know, and, and this was way back. So she stayed with us. She basically raised all my siblings and myself. I'm, I'm the seven in the, in the family of, I'm youngest in the family of seven. So she raised all of us. Then my, my elder sister had her own children. She went and raised my, my nephews and nieces. And there was always a lot of people in the house, extended family. Right, you have your grandmother, grand uncles, aunties, the one who never got married, la, became old mate. Always they're part of the extended family. So we didn't have to worry about about you know having a Filipino maid, an Indonesian maid, or Myanmar's maid coming over now in from Cambodia. We never had to worry about that. But now nuclear families. I mean this this is very evident in the West, more so than here. Um, where it's very costly to uh, to, to to employ a uh, uh, a babysitter So they just rather just send them to daycare But most families now, nuclear families Most families now would have two Can't afford more than two because the cost of education is so high So from extended family to single families From uh, traditional families Father, mother and children Then, but these days You, you, you have this concept of called blended families Because so, the rate of divorce is so high It's like eight is enough Remember that? Eight is enough? Husband got married, got three children, then got separated, divorced, or maybe spouse passed away. Wife also maybe had children from a different marriage. Then single again, they come together, they have ready-made families. The moment they get married, they've got six children. Yeah, the eight in and half, they have eight children. Yeah? Uh, from heterogeneous to homogeneous, it's male and female. These days it's female and female, male and male. Right? Um, not bad people, they are good people, wonderful people, but it's just that you know, society just views things very, very differently, right? Um, from parents to single parents. We always talk about this is my parents, but no. So many, remember I, I, I used the word single parent, it, it, they have different meanings, yeah? Either single parent by choice because they are separated, or single parent because they never remarried, and I just raised the, the, the children alone. So the child from very young grows up just with the notion of I have only one parent. I don't know where the other parent is. Or they might have visitation rights, but it raises different kinds of problems. From biological, bio parents to pro parents, professional parents. Who are these professional parents? Your domestic helpers. They are the professional parents. You come home, magadang <laughs> umaga po. Your 10 year old or 5 year old child will say, they learn to speak a foreign language faster than they learn to speak your own ethnic uh, dialect. Yeah, because they spend more time with the mate than they actually spend time with the biological parents. By the time you get up in the morning, they're still asleep. By the time you come back, they're still asleep. <laughs> okay? And who do they spend the rest of the 8, 10 hours with, 12 hours with, with the helpers that we pay? Okay? Of course, then, got implications. They will have the values 
of, of the helpers. And so you have to make sure that you have good, good helpers, otherwise the kind of horror stories that we have. So new forms of parenting, and therefore it raises different crises. Yeah? Different crises. It's a crisis in methodology. Our approach to parenting, certainly very different. When we were brought up, we were brought up in a certain way, very authoritarian way. Now, I have to discuss. It's more democratic. Now, it is, ah, yeah, never mind. Nah. Don't stress out the children because we did all these modern parenting things. Yeah? Your, your, your children, those of you my age, you've got already uh, young adult uh, children and then you've got grandchildren who are two, three years old and your children would say, ah, yeah, mommy, daddy, that done very old-fashioned already. These days, you know, the, the modern humanistic approach yeah, for children growing up, you just let them play. Don't stress them out. Otherwise, self-esteem get affected. So when they put you to, with the grandparents and then they see you reprimanding, hey, you, they, you shouldn't do that. You know when you scold them what will happen to them and they will quote all the psychology books. So just let them run around, never mind, make noise. Make noise, scream. Just don't stress them, don't stress them. You have to trust them. Right? That, 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 so so you know, crisis in methodology and then conflict between parent and grandparent and, and child, and grandparent and uh, parent and child and the grand, grandchild. Yeah? It's a crisis in content. What we learn, our values are, are very, very different. So what we were brought up in, in terms of content, very different from what children today know. What was important to us is not important anymore. It's important to young children. Yeah? And it certainly is a crisis in credibility. In the old days, it was do as I say, don't do as I do. Correct or not? So, so this case of this um, principal who, who shared with me his experience, uh, he was very, very experienced uh, uh, Irish brother. He says one of the most embarrassing moments for him as a principal was one, when he was, and he was a chain smoker. He said when he was in the office one day, the prefects brought in two students, two students, right? Smoking in the school toilet, where else? <laughs> uh, and um, as when they brought him in, what was the principal doing? Smoking in his office. Now schools are smoke-free zones, yeah? So smoking in the office. So brother, caught smoking. Mm, smoking, huh? All right, he put the cigarette down. Normal punishment for doing things like that, rotan. Okay. Don't more smoking, huh? Smoking is bad for health. <laughs> okay. He's, I mean, he's close to 90 years old, despite all that. Of course, he's, he's suddenly has stopped smoking for a long time because he, he coughs his brains out, even now he's a dear old friend of mine. Uh, but, you know, crisis is incredibility. These days, if you want me to stop smoking, you stop smoking first. Remember the famous story of uh, Gandhi and the, the mother who brought the, the child? Have you, have you heard that story? Gandhiji, you know, this is a boy who is an obese boy who, who is addicted to, to candy. And, uh, you know, the mother brings the, the boy, this is 10 year old boy, Gandhiji, Gandhiji, he says, My son has got a problem with sweets, candy. Cannot stop eating sweets. No, look at him, obese already, bad for his health. He'll get diabetes before he's 21. Can you tell him, please, to stop smoking? He will listen to you because you are the Mahatma. But he won't listen to me as the mother. Okay, Gandhiji says, bring him back in three weeks' time. Okay? Three weeks' time, mother brings him back. So she's confused. Why bring him back to three, three weeks' time? Just tell him now. But okay, I will listen because you tell, I do. Okay? Three weeks' time, Gandhiji says to the boy, you know, your mother is right. You should stop eating candy. Not good for you. So when the mother then sent the boy away, mother asked Gandhiji, why did you have to week, wait three weeks just to say that to the boy? And Gandhi said to the mother, because I wanted to see whether I could survive without sweets for three weeks. <laughs> right? If I'm not able to model this, how do I tell the child to do the same thing? Because they would say, hypocrite. You tell me to do, but you don't want to do. If I want to teach my child respect, I have to show respect to him. I have to show respect to my wife. I have to show respect to the people I talk to. I cannot be shouting at my wife four letter words and then tell my son when my son uses the same language I, as I do towards the mother, I slap the boy and says, don't talk to your mother that way. 
but it's okay for me as the husband to do that. Cannot. It doesn't cut it with young people these days, right? So I have to model this. So crisis and credibility because it's so difficult huh, to, 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 to do all the things that we want our children to do. Yeah, if we want to talk to our children about fidelity, we certainly have to be faithful to the partners that we are married with. Don't talk to the child about those values if we ourselves have not been faithful to our spouses. Yeah? Uh, and, it's, and it's further compounded by less and less time with parents. I mean, it, it's not as if we want to do this. But you know, the cost of living staying in Kuala Lumpur, my God, you know, how do you survive in anything less than how much? What, 3,000, 4,000 ringgit just to get by? To pay for your rent? to all your mortgage, to put petrol. Every time petrol goes up 10 cents, we scream and yell, but no choice, it's already heavily subsidized to, to pay for your children's education. And if you lose confidence in the, in the public school system, we have to send them to private school. Mm, worse still, to send them to international school, right? You, you know the kind of fees we charge for, for children? My God, I had a parent in my office the other day, so many times, went to see the, one of the members of the board, saw my deputy finally before, third time coming to see. He says, uh, before we make this decision, after the third time. And, but before that, she said, the reason why we have taken so long is because we are not rich people. They work with an NGO, an environmental NGO. And of course, yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot of money because you're spending anywhere from 20 to 40. Some of the top international schools have been very established, 70 to 90,000 to 100,000 a year. What you would spend, more money you spend in a year, than Shin had to spend in four years in undergraduate doing psychology at, at, uh, at help. So, so it's so costly these days. Where to find the money? And then, of course, if I'm not around, if my wife has to work, and then we want a certain standard of living, we, we both have to work, no choice, right? And so what do we do? We, and then we have to employ mates for, for, for the child. So less and less time to parent. And, and it's, a, it's a, one of those things of, of the 21st century, yeah? <coughs> and children are just exposed, therefore, and parents are not around. We have so little time. And then when we come back, we see them behave in a certain way, and we want instant results. Why are they like this? Then, the fastest, quickest way, reprimand, threaten, punish, all of those things, because we want instant change. We want instant, uh, perfect children. And, and that's, that's where the conflict happens, uh, continues. So this crisis in parenting continues, and some of the effects that it has on children, yeah? There's a decline in, in family grades, you know, especially when you, you see um, when parents have, don't spend as much time with their children, uh, talking with them, coaching them, mentoring them, helping them with their studies. You will find that there's a decline, yeah? That there's uh, research that actually shows this. When the, we don't spend enough time, quality time, good time with them, not time when they see Papa and Mommy come home, I, I turn off the TV and I go upstairs because whenever Papa and Mommy are in the room with me, we fight. Not that kind of time. But when you have a good relationship with, 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 your, your, with your child, they, want, they look forward to that time. Right? They long for you to be there. They really want you to be there because you, know, uh, you are their parents. When, when, so when the relationship is good and we don't spend enough time and then it exposes them to all sorts of different uh, uh, hosts of, of influences outside, and there's enough studies on, on violence and aggression uh, um, in childhood, how that extends then into adulthood because they are, they, they are watching this. I mean, can you imagine watching Popeye the Sailor? And we all grew up with Popeye the Sailor, man, toot, toot. But you know how violent that show is? Every time he's got a problem with Brutus, he takes his thing, pummel him to the ground. Roadrunner is another thing. He gets exploded here, left, right and centre, the, the, the poor coyote. <laughs> you know, we all grew up in that. Rather than watching Dora, the explorer, Dora, 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 and they all can speak Spanish. <laughs> yeah. You know, movies without violence. My son the other day was asking me, uh, Pap, you know, I, it says, uh, since you bought me a gaming computer, um, the latest one to come out, you know, to, to have a game. No point having a gaming computer if I don't have any games to play. The latest one is Titanfall. <laughs> I said, tell me about Titanfall. It's rated uh, 15 plus. Why is it 15 plus MA? <laughs> For violence. Yeah. Shooting, minor shooting, and you know, my God, I mean, it's just like this, you know, what's the other one, the, the, the other the game war, there was some, there's another um, gaming thing, very, very famous one, uh, um, the game is an army kind of show. I mean, if you grow up playing those sort of violent things, and it's just shooting, exploding, blowing people's heads off, rather than a thoughtful, mindful game of how to resolve conflict to talking, <laughs> and to praying and meditation, that one will put them to sleep after five seconds. Right, but this, oh, 
plenty of shooting and, and exploding. Huh? So, uh, of course, how not to, to develop that kind of aggression yeah, in adulthood because you're spending so many hours playing those sort of games. And finally, these feelings of abandonment, especially for very young children whose families are separated, and I've seen enough in my, in my you know, practice as a counsellor and as a, as a teacher, um, feelings of abandonment, self-blame, low self-esteem, and even when you are together, and we are fighting all the time. I recently had a, a case of a student um, whose uh, mother, in her effort to help this child be, a, in her mind, a better student, would, would reprimand her, would scold her, would ridicule her. And the father, who's hardly around because the father you know, uh, uh, is a pilot and, and he flies around a lot of the time and when they're together, She's closer to the father, but uh, and the father is a mild, gentle kind of soul, but the mother is so aggressive um, to the point that the child feels one night, you know, we were a bit concerned because um, she connect, communicated with one of my teachers just to say, you know, I, don't, I just want to end it all because my parents are fighting. They're throwing things downstairs. I can't stand it anymore. I wish I wasn't born. I don't know if I want to continue living, right? Very, very low sense of self. She was cutting herself. She was hurting herself. She had attempted, she had thought of suicide, you know, for the last so many months already. Yeah. And so when, when as adults in, in the world of our children, if we don't raise, we create the kind of family environment that is conducive for their growth and development, there will be cons very, very dire consequences. So what do we do in all of this? How do we rise with the challenge? Very, very quickly. I have got maybe about 10 minutes more. First thing to do is recognize them. Please recognize them. What do you mean by recognition? A uh, famous psychologist called Eric Byrne, yeah, he came up with this approach to count the psychology called transactional analysis. And for Byrne, a stroke, he calls it a stroke, uh, not the rotan, stroke. Uh, a stroke is a unit of recognition. Every time we recognize, we, we, when we are able to acknowledge the child, whether in all of these ways, verbally, non-verbally, physical, and so forth, we recognize. You are doing a, a lot of recognition for me by sitting and listening to me, right? That's tremendous recognition. Um, and so, let me just lead you through the different kinds of recognition that we can give to our children. Remember how it is, you know, when, 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 um, uh, you know, when you're stroking a, a, a cat, yeah, when you're stroking a cat, you notice what happens to the cat? If you stroke the cat, what happens to, 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 to the backbone? The bum will go up, isn't it? Yeah. So physical recognition allows for healthy, physical, normal uh, uh, development in very young children. That's why we spend many hours when the child is born, a newborn baby. We carry the child, we pet and we pet and we pet and we pet and we pet. And Burn documented a, an interesting case um, of uh, a child that was neglected at birth because mother, you know, thought babies were a poor excuse for human beings. So very much left the child and just you know, put the bottle there and ended up that the child, after many months of neglect, not enough human touch, suffered from psychological or physical damage to the brain. There was uh, damage to her own physical growth. She wasn't growing physically as what a child of her age should be growing. Yeah? Um, so physical recognition is one, by, by touching. But you can't go around hugging everybody, isn't it? Huh? Hi, I recognize you and I give you a hug, I'll get a slap in the face. That is also recognition, <laughs> right? So I cannot go around simply, simply touching people because, you know, I learned from this parenting talk, I should hug, you know, physical. Our culture, we, we, we don't do that, yeah? So there are other forms. We have to find other ways of recognizing people. Verbal recognition, what is verbal recognition? Hi, we say, hi, how are you? Good morning, yeah? Thank you very much, right? Uh, Non-verbal recognition, uh, sometimes it's just a wave. Okay, a thumbs up. That's, that's non-verbal. Yeah, written recognition. We, we send thank you card. Yeah, we send an acknowledgement uh, to, to to someone. Okay, well done, job well done. Send emails. Okay, and then symbols. Valentine's Day. You 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 know you give to to girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife. You know a a, a ring la, or, a, or a rose la, or a box of chocolates. Okay, but recognition you also have positive and negative. <coughs> so physical recognition. I hug one person. I slap another person. Positive, the other one is negative. Uh, verbal recognition, I say, well done, I say, go to hell. Okay? Uh, non verbal recognition, I wave, and the other one, I do this. Okay? I show finger. And then the written recognition, okay? Um, I said, you know, I, I give you an increment, this one, you are fired. 
yeah, uh, 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 retrenchment letter. Symbols, I give this one a rose, I give this one a bullet. Yeah, positive recognition and negative recognition. Can be also genuine or fake. So I, I say, wow, you look so pretty today. Ah. Versus, wow, you look so pretty today. Genuine and fake. Right? Sometimes it's very sarcastic. Yeah? And sometimes some of us, yeah, because we are dying for recognition, sarcastic also, I'll take it. <laughs> okay? So put it all together. Put it all together. Okay? You have conditional and also unconditional recognition. We say to our child, I love you if you come back with straight A's. I love you if you are able to come back with straight A's for your exams. I will give you what you want if you come back with straight A's. Then you can ask me for reward. Conditional. So if you don't come back with straight A's, what does that mean? I don't love you as much. That's the... So we should say, I love you. You go and tell your spouse that today. I love you. After 30 years of marriage, you go and tell your spouse, I love you. She will look at you and say, ah, 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 what do you want now? <laughs> ah, what did you do now? What did you do? <laughs> Why after 30 years of marriage, you never said that to me. Now only you are telling me you love me. After 30 years, did you do something wrong? She says, no. I, I just love you. No, because, no, I just do. <laughs> you know, I, this very interesting um, a YouTube um, clip that I saw by one of these famous um, uh, drama actors in the theatre. And she was doing a satire on, on eulogies and then on funerals and that. And she made a very interesting comment. She said, my husband passed away. You know, this was during the, the eulogy. And says, one thing about my husband, he... he Whenever he slept, he snored like an elephant. But that snoring, she said, was music to my ears. It was music to my ears. Why was it music? Because if he snored, I knew he was alive. <laughs> if he stopped snoring, I would be wondering, is he still alive? <laughs> Maybe he passed away suddenly in his death, had a massive heart attack. The snoring is music to my ears. So my wife and I, you know, we say this <laughs> to one another, both of us are major snorers. So conditional, unconditional, yeah? Um, put it all together, all the different stroke combinations, genuine, positive, unconditional. That's what you say. Son, girl, thank you for being my daughter. I'm so proud of you. Why? No reason. Genuine, positive, unconditional. You don't have to do anything for me that's the fact that you are alive, your gift, your presence itself is a gift to me. How many times have we said that to one another, to our spouses and the people who mean so much to us? A lot of the times we say that because we want something in return. And a lot of the times we grew up being taught, never say this to your children. Because if visitors come to the house and say, Wow, Shrina, so quiet one, ah. so pretty. Hey, don't say that to her, otherwise the head get very big. <laughs> we remember that? Don't praise, don't praise. Our culture, don't praise. Cannot, cannot, cannot. You praise, she will stop working hard, she will stop looking good, she will, she will get proud. Stop, don't, 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 don't. What must you do? Scold. Reprimand. Put down. Ah, that one is okay. <laughs> but don't praise, don't praise. What we are saying is, no. Recognition re requires us to do this for survival, huh? Positive, genuine, unconditional. If you can't do that, then at least genuine, conditional. Yeah? Uh, try and do your best. Yeah? If you can, do well in your exams. I love you because. That's conditional. Okay? Then you have genuine, negative, conditional. Genuine, conditional. So if I, I go up to, to Shin on this side, and Shin is, you know, five-year-old or eight-year-old getting reprimanded already and then when the child, when you're scolding the child and she starts to <laughs> stop crying I told you, 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 you're a sissy or what? Stop crying! You, then sometimes you don't have to say anything Yeah? You cry again hmm? 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 <laughs> Because of all the threats the <laughs> And after a while, the child will grow up with asthma <laughs> Right? But conditional, huh? you do 
again, you watch out. But it's recognition, negative. And the third one, fourth one, is genuine, unconditional, negative. Total condemnation. Go to hell. And you'll be lucky that the devil will take you. Because you're such a horrible human being. You're evil personified. You're worse than the devil. I, get out of my house. I disown you completely. You are not my child anymore. Con total condemnation. And of course, there's the fifth one. That is a mix. A mixed stroke. We do this a lot as parents. You come back with the good marks, 80 marks. Well done, son. Well done. Next test, huh? 90 marks. I pat you and I give you a kick in the backside after that. We say that to our employees also. Good job, good job. But you can do better here. <laughs> yeah? You do better now, but do better again later on. I work so hard and I still, it's always a mixed stroke. Out of all of this, which is the best and which is the worst? What do you think? Which is the best and which is the worst? You've got to move fast, not enough time. Which is the best, which is the worst? The best is positive, genuine, positive, unconditional. And which is the worst? Negative, genuine, negative, and conditional. Even though genuine, negative, unconditional is bad, it is not as bad as number six. <laughs> That's the worst. But that is not as bad as number six. Number six is the worst kind. Of recognition which is no recognition let me explain okay teacher walks into the classroom walks into the classroom 40 students in the class as he's teaching he turns around okay John stop talking making noise warning huh it's right on the board then turns around John is still talking John I told you I warn you now stand on the chair stand on the chair Last one, you do that again, you are in serious trouble. Then he turns, turns around. What is John doing when he's on the chair? What do you think John is doing when he's on the chair? John just got number, negative, conditional. Yeah? But why is John so happy? Why is John so happy? Because he just got recognized. <laughs> Better than no recognition. And then when he turns around, you are, uh, you stand on the desk and then after that your father, mother all get called in you, you, What type of child who brought you up in this world? Stand on the desk and he's so happy, overjoyed Overjoyed, oh, finally someone has recognized me A lot of the times children misbehave, why? They just want recognition Better negative than no recognition You know what in the old days, uh, not in the old days When they used to have the Internal Security Act What did they used to do? Any special ranch people around the place? <laughs> You know what was the worst thing they did in the first 60 days? Solitary confinement. Because we are all social beings. Solitary confinement was one of the worst forms of punishment. You don't talk to nobody. And human beings shrivel up because we need social contact. The worst possible form of recognition is no recognition. Huh? So, the um, question is which have our children been, been getting the most? In all the last one week, two weeks, something to think about. Burn. Of course, this is this is this is not enough research on, on this. This is for basic maintenance. Yeah, you need something like eight to twelve strokes, positive strokes a day. Yeah, for growth and development, you need anywhere for more than twelve strokes a day, just for maintenance. For growth and development, you need more than twelve, just to survive. We need at least eight to ten positive strokes. Have you been getting a lot of this? Uh, most times, what have we been getting? Negative. And so that's why many of us, and a lot of the times, no stroke, no matter how good we are, they don't. We only highlight people when they do wrong. Our children especially, not when they do good. And then when they do wrong, we will use this killer sentence. You are always like this. You are always like this. Right? So even though, out of, out of one whole week, just like a normal employer, I give you a workplace scenario, huh? A person comes to, 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 to work late on Tuesday. And then he comes to work late on Friday. On Friday, you tell him, you are always like this, always coming late. But sir, that's not true. 
Monday, I came on time. Tuesday, I admit I came late. Wednesday, you came late. <laughs> I came on time, but you. Thursday, I was absent. Today, I came late. So I was late twice. But we overgeneralize. You are always like this. And that's how it is. Huh? The moment we overgeneralize and we delete the positive, we will only see what we want to see to reinforce our opinion of the other person. That's normal human psychology. Okay? So when children are behaving, and they are behaving, recognize them. Because that's a way of helping them then you know, put perspective to their lives. Okay, so let's move on. Huh? Give them strokes. <coughs> Be a child's best friend. Spend quality time. What is quality time? Huh? Because remember, we said there's so little time to parent. So at most, you might have half an hour, one hour with your child if you come back from work, if you're lucky, in, during the week. Yeah, very difficult to spend enough time. Because they are, we've got so much of homework for them, la. they've got Sunday school, la. even on weekends. And when we say quality time, make sure that our children want to be with us during that time. Not the moment you come back from work, the first thing we do is nag and scold and scream and yell and lecture and criticize. Yeah? And after a while, the moment you, they hear the door opening, they will go up to the room. Because they know already, la, I'll get scolding for watching TV. I'll get scolding. The first thing is, so finish homework or not? So what do you do today? Ah, were you good or not? <laughs> so, so, I mean, before we can even build a relationship, yeah, even though if the house is like a war zone, don't criticize the war zone, connect with the child first because we've been away for a period of time. Right? So quality time, these are the criteria for quality time. If you really want to spend quality time, some things to remember. Number one, no criticizing judgment. So that they associate the time with you as something positive. Not something negative. Yeah? No criticizing. Number two, it has to be effortful. Effortful means sitting down, watching TV is not effortful. Yeah? Sitting down to play a game, family fun night, every Saturday, play Monopoly, play some board game. That's effortful. Going to watch a movie is not effortful. Yeah? It must be something that is mutually enjoyable. Okay, you say, oh, yeah, one month, three months, we haven't got up for something. Okay, I will reward you. Right? We go and watch the opera at the Sydney Opera House. My children will look at me and say, I don't like opera. <laughs> but Papa loves opera. Papa enjoys listening to the Sopranos going, ah! <laughs> It has to be mutually. Don't say, the, the child says, I want to go and see K-pop, but mommy or your K-pop is noise to my ears. Right? So we both have to agree on doing an activity that is mutually enjoyable. Then, it's, it's rich. We can go and talk about it. Yeah? So agree on it and it has to be done consistently. Doing all of those things consistently, not once a week, not once a month, not once a fortnight, but something that is done regularly. Yeah? Most importantly, please don't make promises we cannot keep. Better, better not to promise otherwise. Better to say, we'll see. And at least your child will know, we'll see means no. <laughs> okay? Okay. This is something I, 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 I've often had to remind you know, very young parents about. I, I, I have many of them in my school. And especially when they are you know, year one, year two, preschool. Huh? I, I, I see children come to school, shoelaces not tied. And I ask them, tie your shoelace, don't know how to do. Then who ties your shoelaces when they get undone? My mother or my maid. And then when I ask the mother, why don't you allow the teach your child how to tie the shoelaces? Ah, yeah, they just take too long. <laughs> they just take too long. So better for me to just... How do they learn? They come to school, First 15, 20 minutes in the class, the mother is in the class checking to see you got all the books, la, checking to see everything is there, la, going to the cupboard. La. The boy is just sitting there going around playing. The mother is the one, the standard one, the pupil. <laughs> the mother is the one in standard one, not the boy. He's enjoying school. She's the one getting stressed. And the teachers get stressed because the mothers are around. <laughs> They, they, we, we don't help them learn. We don't have them learn independence. We don't have them learn take to resp responsibility. So don't bail them out. And you know, every time the child tells you something, it doesn't mean it's true, right? I had one case um, recently because we just had an outbreak of uh, some cases of hand, foot, and mouth. And um, you know, immediately that evening itself, we had to close the school the following day. And uh, and and I got a you know very strong email from a parent. My son said that he was sitting next to a preschool child, even though, you know, no verification. How could he have allowed this to happen and so forth, so forth. I want an explanation. I want an explanation. 
Half an hour later, she sent a letter of apology. I am deeply sorry. My son told me he was just making up stories. <laughs> right? So without clarifying, you know, fortunately, I, I didn't check the email early. I would have responded in, in uh, you know, I, because I, I needed to check whether it's true. And I said, how can it be? Because we quarantined. You know, the whole preschool was closed. There was only one preschool boy that was there, and, and there's no way because all the primary and secondary school who had siblings in the preschool were all quarantined, so there's no way a regular kid could be with a sibling or with any child in the preschool. Yeah, because the school was already closed. The preschool was closed. So, you see, they don't always uh, tell the truth. They just make up stories, and children at that age. So, we need to learn to let them apologize. Don't fight their battles for them. Yeah? Sometimes if they cry, they cry. You know, in the old days when teachers used to scold them, scold us, yeah, we'd be terrified. Now, if the teachers scold you, you go and tell the parents, the parents will come and scold the teacher. <laughs> yeah? In the old days, the teacher scold you and then reports you, yeah, and uh, when you go home, you will get double scolding, you will get double rotan in the old days. Okay? So, let them, let them fight their own battles. Uh, otherwise, we're not really helping them. At the same time, um, be clear about structures, you know, don't just allow our children because we don't spend enough time and so we compensate for it by allowing them to do all sorts of different things, yeah? Uh, watch TV la, because we feel guilty, so never mind, let them and have enjoyment and so forth. And so it's important, some structure is important and they have to therefore take responsibility for the structures, yeah? Because we teach them responsibility. If you don't do certain things, there will be consequences. What will happen when you violate this? But what will happen when you don't deliver on your homework and so forth? There will be consequences and that's fine. That's fine because they still need to take responsibility for their lives, yeah? Um, look into your own. Now, that was about children. And this is important now because there are a lot of studies that, that show that when parents themselves are not spiritual beings, yeah, then children themselves will grow up to get a lack of direction. Yeah, so I'm so thrilled over the fact that this is Sunday. You know, many of you are working people, you are tired, you've got so many other responsibilities, but you take time to spend time in the temple to, to, you know, to, to go through your own spiritual development. Because, and that's, that's, that's important. It's part of Asia. No? It's part of all the great religions originated from Asia. And it's important that we ourselves go through this journey of growth in our lives. We are not perfect human beings, but that certainly helps give our children some grounding that there's more to life than just material things there's more to life than just fun and so forth. Well, all of that is wonderful and important we need to also look at other forms of our our uh, ourselves uh, because we, we are not just uh, uh, physical beings we are also spiritual beings uh, there's a greater purpose in our lives okay um some studies uh, that show that there's an inverse relationship between religious religiosity and youth having sex number of sexual partners recentness so the more spiritual the more religious children are growing up, they are more able to deal with their own sexuality, okay? And here's something from, from the own, uh, my own Catholic uh, tradition. Uh, it's, it's called evangelization in the, in the modern world, yeah? And, and uh, you know, those who go out to talk about the faith, there's a very nice saying that modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. If it does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. Remember, I talked to you about learning how to model, yeah? Uh, and if we don't model, it, it doesn't, you know, uh, children don't listen to us because you do first, then I will listen, yeah? Okay. And of course, one of the important things is that we need to take time with our marriage, spend time with our spouses because the environment that we raise our children in is so critical for their success. Very young children, huh? from the early years until 10, 12 years old. Values are formed in those 10, 12 years. And very young children respond only emotionally, feelings, yeah, kinesthetically. They can't process. They sound intelligent, but the brain hasn't developed to understand concepts. So they just know when they come to a situation in the house when husband and wife constantly fighting and they, you know, I, I've, I have, I've had students in the university who talk about this, you know, when they go home, the house is like a war zone. Parents fight on a regular basis, throwing things at one another, right? They have to duck, duck, you know. Um, they become very good in sports because of the ducking. But, uh, but uh, it, 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 it sends them this sense of, of insecurity. All, the one girl was saying, and I remember many years ago, she said, all I do when I go home is I close the door, lock it, 
and I sit and cry. That's all I do. Very unhappy. So, we have to create an environment, that emotional, psychological, social environment where children feel safe, where they feel loved. Then there's less of a chance for them to grow up dysfunctional. <coughs> Model for them, huh, what a good marriage looks like. Let me end with this, yeah? Glasser said this, some very nice uh, statement. I believe to be happy, we need to be close to other happy people. Not around toxic people whose only goal in life is to complain about everything and anything that they can complain about. The moment they open their mouth is negativity. Yeah? Therefore, the fewer happy people there are, the less chance of us finding happiness ourselves. The world is filled with lonely, frustrated, angry, unhappy people who are not able to get close to anyone who is happy. Why? Because the main social skills are complaining, blaming, criticizing. Hardly the way to get along with other people. Let me leave you with that thought. And thank you for being such a wonderful uh, uh, group of people coming in on a Sunday. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Gerard. Uh, anyone who has questions to ask, it's time for you to ask questions. Any questions regarding on the talk? Good morning, Dr. Good morning. Okay, um, I, I was a little bit late, rather half an hour late for this talk, so I'm not sure whether you actually stressed on um, um, what you call relationships, uh, attractions to the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I, I have this encounter with my 16-year-old girl. She has been, um, well, I would say she's attracted to a boy, a classmate of hers, and um, recently my husband and I sat down with them. We had a very frank talk to them about this matter. But uh, what I realized is that after having spoken to them, uh, as you said just now, we have sort of given them recognition. And we have sort of given them recognition that we have recognized that they are attracted to each other. So, uh, but what I feel right now is that um, even though we have stated our stand as to how far they can pursue this relationship, uh, what I notice is this boy seems to have come back to me, um, you know, as I'm uh, give, asking me a lot of permissions to bring my daughter out here and there, which I feel sometimes it's a little bit um, yes and no, uh, whether I should really pursue this because we have already stated a stand that we do not want this to go on a serious level. But, mm. but because of the recognition, as you say, the, he is coming on strongly and thinking that we kind of um, approve. approve it. So, so where do we go from here? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, a couple of things to, to bear in mind. Um, as I said, um, understanding teenagers is a talk for another day. <laughs> right? Um, and it, it's, it's not an easy phase of life. Um, the kind of uh, physical hormonal changes that take place uh, you know are, are, are very normal it, it, whether we like it or not it will kick in you know? think of the old days 60 years ago 50 years ago right and the old days meaning in the in the 40s in the 50s our grandparents if you recall, remember if you remember your grandparents how old were they when they actually got married about that age 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, right? When puberty basically kicked in, in the old days, when hormones already kicked in and they were already starting to, you know, have the sexual awakening, they were already married off. And they had, therefore, they are, by the time they are 30, 7, 8 children, the full complement, you can even have a football team. I had aunts and aunties who actually had 10, 11 children. You can start a football team, even with one reserve. Um, and, and so... These days, the same phenomenon, whether we like it or not, and in fact, puberty kicks in even earlier because of, of, of nutrition and diet and so forth. It even kicks in earlier. But what do we say to our children? When that happens, when you know, uh, your, your, your body starts to change and the hormones start to come in and then you have that attraction, 
you're not allowed to go take cold showers, run around the block, throw yourself into a thorn bush. Like, you know, in my church, they call it St. Francis of SCC, if you remember. Uh, don't act on, on those impulses. And you say the only time you can have this is by the time you finish, when you're 24 years old, finish university, and then you can consider about getting married. And so people do. They do try to wait. And it's a very difficult situation to be in as parents. Yeah? On the one hand, we recognize it is full blown. Our children, you know, have this sexual awakening. And this is part and parcel of human existence. For human life to continue, this will happen. The question we are asking is when should it happen? How long should we ask them to wait? Right? And, and therefore, that is where the issue is. Uh, you can set boundaries, you can set rules. Yeah? And you, I think it's more important that you talk. The, the, those rules and boundaries are with your daughter, right? And to finally have her take responsibility for those actions. Yes, well, well, the, the greatest danger always is for the girl to be um, pregnant before marriage, and especially when she's at that age, when she's got a whole future ahead of her. When you think about it, it's another eight years more for her. If she told you this at 24, she already has a degree, you would actually be quite happy. You know, and you're welcome, and if she you know, introduce you, introduces you to a boyfriend that she's been going out with for three months, six months, you know, you're, you're waiting for the possibility of having your first grandchild. Six to eight years is not such a long time, actually, but for them, it's a lifetime, right? So it's, it's, it's trying to manage that with her. It's not so much whether she is out with someone, but helping teenagers make choices that will help them later on in the selection of a life partner helping them make choices that will help them understand the consequences and which I'm sure you already have done, right? That is maybe actually another six to eight years more, okay? Uh, if you are going to still can't wait, then I, you know, uh, uh, some parents go to the extreme of saying then you bring them to the house. I don't want you outside. If you want, you talk to them, uh, uh, be spend time with them, not in your room but outside in the public. You can spend time with them because it's just trying to minimize the kind of risk because the, 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 the teenage mind is still growing and choices that they make may not always be um, wise because they're still you know, uh, growing until about maybe 18 to 20 years old. The, the brain is still developing, right? So because of the lack of ability to make those sort of adult choices and to take responsibility for that, the risk for them is higher. But we just need to tell them another six to eight years more and then after that, I will rejoice and celebrate your boyfriends, okay? But it's just that. If it still doesn't work and, you know, it, it turns out uh, that she does end up getting pregnant, is, is it the end of the world? That's the question I ask. Um, I tell parents then, your grandparents uh, earlier than you anticipated. However, remember, uh, always in context, life is 70, 80 for those who are strong. Okay? They say in, in some scriptures. And therefore, even if they have to stop schooling for a while, Life continues. They can still, you know, day and age of, of education, they can still continue later on in life. It's just too bad she will have to struggle a little bit more. Okay? So it, it's, not, it's not the worst case scenario. We try to avoid that. But if despite all your measures at trying to, you know, to, to defer that from happening, but it still happens, in, and it sometimes happens simply because the relationship between the parent and the child, uh, the parents and the child is already so damaged. That because you say white, I will say black. Because you say don't, I will do. And then I regret it and say I should have listened to my parent. So always try to first maintain the relationship. Communicate love, communicate understanding, communicate support. But be clear about those boundaries. You don't want to lose the child simply because of this. Yeah? No easy answer. I, I, I grant you that. No easy answer. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah.